I think uh, I start. Uh, so today I have two topics. So the first one is from energy landscape to free energy landscape. To free energy Okay, so let me remind you what we got yesterday about the uh, energy landscape of the P-spin spherical model, and again with the idea that it wasn't just the uh, uh, energy landscape of the uh, P-spin spherical model, but in, in reality, this kind of property of the energy landscape are common to many, many different systems, mean field system. So let me draw. So here I have the energy axis, and if you remember, I had uh, a ground state here energy and at the ground state there were few states which were very uh, with many direction which I mean that uh, go up so they are very uh, let's say um, stable and then if I go up in energy I have more states so I have an exponential number of states I know that if I look to the eigenvalues of the Hessian they move towards zero so they are become shallower and then if I arrive at a certain energy which I call E threshold, then I know that the states become, I mean, this minima becomes marginally stable. And then if I go even up, then I had uh, saddles. I mean, I have uh, typically uh, the critical points are saddles with an extensive number of negative directions. Okay? So this is what we got yesterday. Okay, so now what I want to do is well, what I, I dis discuss what happens if I raise the temperature. So if I raise the temperature, well, first I um, okay, we'll do it here. Um, so let me do an analogy first, which is something actually that Gilles discussed already this morning. So let's think to the ferromagnetic Ising model. So in this case, and let's say in finite dimension, okay? Because I think this everybody knows. And if I'm below, well, let's say I consider the system below TC. Actually, I start from the case at T equals zero. So I know how is the energy landscape in this case. I know that there are two global uh, minima, and there is one minimum which corresponds to all spins up, and the minimum which corresponds to all spins down, okay? And then, well, what happens if I raise a little bit the temperature? So I know that if, I mean, I'm in dimension higher than one, there is a critical transition temperature. So I know that if I raise a little bit the temperature, well, this, I mean, I, I will add fluctuation on top of this minimum, but the states will remain magnetized. So if I start from the state plus, I will remain with, a sta with, with I would have, a, let's say, a probability measure, which is, concentrated around configuration which are magnetized uh, plus, and if I start here, I will have configuration which are magnetized mainly minus, okay? And I know that, I mean, what is, I don't want at all to enter into the discussion what I, uh, well, what we call state, really, from the statistical mechanic point of view, because it's something subtle. So for me, would be something, let's say, defined in a pragmatic way. If I start, so it's would be a state, meaning that if I take a configuration in, let's say, uh, uh, we, so let's say here in this case, I would say that I would say that the system is in the state plus, in the sense that if I take a configuration which is positively magnetized, if uh, the system is big enough, I know that the system will remain here, will be positively magnetized, and for all practical purposes, if I look just to the dynamic, the system will be in a stationary state which is positively magnetized, that for me is just the state, the, the state which corresponds to uh, the IC model in well, the positively magnetized state. Okay? I think it's, I hope it's fine for everybody. So it's just a dynamic definition, okay? And I know that, well, if I wait long enough, actually, I know that I, I can go from the plus state to the minus state, but this takes a very long time which how uh, this is what also G discussed. So what I know is that, well, if I wait a very long time, so what happens if I'm at finite temperature, so I will have that the system will try to create droplet of the minus state. But typically these droplets uh, disappear, but if I wait long enough, there will be a very gigantic droplet that forms, and I will have a system in which I will have here plus, here plus, and here minus, okay? And then when I'm here, then I'm the top of the barrier. 
so the system can decide to go, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just random, can go back here, but it also can go back, it can go here, okay? And so in energy, if I discuss this in energy, and this, so it looks like that if I just, so again, this is a sketch because I'm just doing in one dimension, but in a certain sense, I have two minima, uh, to the two global minima, and then I have a barrier between the two, and I know that the barrier here, if this is the linear size L, it scale like L to the D minus one, okay? This is what is known. It's just how much it costs to create the interface. And so the time to do this, to go from here to here, goes like exponential, a positive constant, L D minus one divided by the temperature, okay? So if the system is large enough, L is large enough, for all practical purposes, the system will remain here, so we'll define this as a state, and if I start from here, well, same thing, it will remain, remain here, okay? And, okay, there would be much to say about this process. Uh, I mean, for example, here I say that there is this energy barrier which costs L to D minus one. I mean, it's not just that there is a big cost, it's also that it's very hard, it's very difficult actually to find this barrier, so to find the path that brings you through here to there, okay? But I mean, for what I want to say is just that here we know how to go from the global minima to, I mean, the ferromagnetic state, okay? Which means that here I start with all Si equal to plus one at zero temperature, and then I know that, well, at finite temperature when T is larger than zero and less than Tc, I mean, I will have a state here with a positive magnetization. And here I have, will have a state with a negative magnetization. And I can also compute, if I want, the free energy of this, okay, of this, the free energy of this state, okay? Okay, so this is what happens for the uh, IZ model in finite dimension. Now, when you look to the mean film, mean film system, so the, for example, well, the one that we discussed yesterday, so we found a lot of minima. And uh, now I want to raise the temperature. So what's going to happen is that Again, if I raise the temperature, I can do exactly as I did here. Well, in principle, uh, so in the P-spin model, we have a certain, so we have, a, let's say, a certain minimum alpha, and which corresponds to a certain uh, configuration of the spin, Si alpha. And, I mean, pictorially, it corresponds to a certain minimum here, okay? in the energy landscape. Now, if I raise the temperature, what the system is going to do is that it's going to fluctuate around this minimum, but there are extensive barriers to go to other minima, okay? So the barrier in the case of mean field model, as Gilles said, so the barrier scales, scales like n, the size of the system, okay? So this means, again, that if I put I mean, imagine that I take uh, the system, at, I mean, I do some kind of stochastic dynamics, Monte Carlo, for example, or I can do Langevin dynamics. I start in the initial condition close to this minimum. Then uh, if I wait long enough on time scale of order one, the system will thermalize inside this minimum. And then actually the time it takes to, to go to another minimum, so to change, as I said, state, is extremely big. So it goes like, so the time to change state, it will be like exponential, a constant, big N, divided by the temperature, okay? So for all practical purposes, what I have is that the probability, this, if I start here, the probability distribution will go to a stationary probability distribution, which corresponds to what I will call the state associated to this minimum, okay? And so I can define also, so exactly as I have, so this is for t equals zero. So when t is different from zero, so I will have, instead of having one a configuration Si alpha, I will have, so now, uh, that's important. So until uh, today, I use for the average, this average I use it for the quench disorder. So from now on, this is the thermal average because I have the temperature which is different from zero and the quench disorder average will be the over bar, okay? So now this, so now if I take Si, for example, is spin I, and I take its average, so its average over on the state alpha, will be equal to mi alpha, okay? What is this is really what I say to you. So this average, you have to think that if I raise the temperature, well, the system will equilibrate inside this, let's say, basin. And inside this basin, so I will have a certain probability distribution, which is peak around here. And on this probability distribution, which correspond to the state alpha, I can compute averages. 
I can compute, for example, the average of SI will give me MI alpha. Okay? I can also, in principle, define a free energy, which is a function of MI. And exactly like here, I have an energy, which is a function of SI. And this is a minimum, because the ADSI is equal to zero when SI is SI alpha. Also here, I can define a free energy, which is such that df mi dmi is equal to zero when mi is equal to mi alpha. Okay? Now, I'm telling you that this can be done. I'm not going to do it, but in principle, I mean, there are, you can really construct what is the free energy function as a function of the magnetization. So you can really study. I mean, if here you have, let's say, an energy landscape which is like this, then there is a version of this at finite temperature, okay, which is, again, like this, in which, actually, you have minima, and these minima correspond to the states. So the states are this lamp, probability lamp, around the minimum, okay? Which are, and so these states are associated, are, let's say, a finite temperature version of the minima that I have here at zero temperature, okay? Now, this free energy is called the top free energy, which is Taules, Anderson, and Palmer. Free energy. And, uh, and I think Florent Zagala will discuss, I mean, will derive this in his lecture uh, next week. Okay, so for the moment, I'm just been telling you that this can be done, and this is, let's say, the finite temperature version of the energy. As Gilles said, and I will not uh, repeat, I mean, all these things work well because we are in, within field theory. I mean, the fact that I can associate a minimum to a, uh, to a state, I mean, a free energy, uh, a minimum of the free energy landscape to a minimum of the energy landscape, also this works well because we are in Mean within me field theory, and especially we, because I consider also the P-spin spherical model. So this is just to tell you that there are clear difficulties if I want to uh, uh, generalize this description to finite dimension, as Gilles said. But for the moment, we just stay within me field theory in infinite dimension, and all these things can be done. And tomorrow, I will tell you more about what's going to happen if we, if we try to do finite dimension. But for the moment, there is no problem, okay? Um, so now, since exactly like in this case, we can define, to, for each minimum, we can define a state. And actually, in the, for the P-spin spherical model, it's not true in general, but for the P-spin spherical model, Mi alpha is particularly simple, is equal to Si alpha, the one that you find uh, at zero temperature, times square root of Q, okay? Where Q is a parameter that we will call overlap and that we'll discuss later. So this Q depends well, in, well, it can depend, on, of course, on temperature, but you see, so the Mi alpha are really very close to the Si alpha that you get uh, at zero temperature. And when T goes to zero, Q goes to one, so you get the same uh, minimum, okay? Okay, so now, to each state, we have a free energy, so what we can do is that we can add an axis here, which is the temperature, okay? And now, what I want to plot is not the energy, actually, but it's more the free energy, okay, of the states. So we know that at this, if you are at temperature zero, so we have all this minima that I described. Now, states are defined only in this regime, okay, because I know that here, if I put a little bit of temperature, the system whoop, will fall down. Instead, here, if I put it here, it will remain here, okay? So states are well defined uh, if I raise the temperature only in this interval. Okay? Now, if I raise the temperature, well, I can follow, so I can define a free energy for each one of these states, and so let me, so what I get in general is that I can follow, so this, the free energy goes down with, with temperature, and what, this is what typically you get. Okay, so this curve here stops at a certain point. So what I mean here is that I can, let's say, I start from these states, which are, are, have this energy, have this kind of action. Uh, then I raise the temperature. So what I have to think is that now I raise the temperature, so that I have something which fluctuates around the minimum. And then I raise, I raise, I raise. At a certain point, I have so strong fluctuation, thermal fluctuation, that 
I mean, there is no state anymore. So I can jump out of the state if you want, okay? So this is the spin over of the states here. And it's quite normal that, as you see, the more our sta the states are stable, the more I can raise the temperature before they break, okay? So this and this one are the ones that disappear first, and this one are the ones that disappear later. Yes? Yeah. You shouldn't know more, yes. So it was just, uh, let's say, an a posteriori justification. It's true that it's the nonlinearity that gives you where it's going to disappear. <laughs> well, so if you do this, you don't get the, r the, the correct curve. So you just get an approximation. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. But, I mean, but, but it's intuitively they behave in a way that you can think. Uh, uh, so, I mean, the more, the more deep states are more stable, so you have to raise the temperature more. But it's true. You have to take into account no linearities to get the, uh, yeah. Okay. So, questions on this? How is that that at our threshold energy you assume this? Yeah, because actually uh, the fact is that the, uh, so you know that you have flat direction, but not that the, uh, I mean, you, have, you can have the, you have a flat direction, but it goes up at the end. So this is the reason why. Okay, so now, okay, we have this picture. And now that we have the free energy of all the states, we can compute the thermodynamics. Okay, so let's compute the thermodynamics. So to compute the thermodynamics, what I have to do is I have the partition function Z. And, well, in principle, I have to do the sum over all configuration of exponential minus beta H of C. But now, I mean, you have to think that the probability measure, that's the, and this is something, again, that can be uh, shown, but uh, for the moment, I mean, for today, there are almost no computation, just words. So the probability measure is really concentrated in some pocket of the configuration space around the minima, okay? And so what you can do is that you can replace this by a sum over alpha. Alpha are all is the index for all the states at temperature T. And then I put exponential minus beta F alpha of N. So F alpha is the free energy, intensive free energy of state alpha. And well, N is N, big N is big N, okay? So I'm just decomposing, if you want, I'm decomposing this sum, which is over all the configuration space, in, well, a part which is the pocket around uh, one minimum, and above another, which is around another minimum, and so on and so forth. Okay? Yeah? Yes, exactly. In the Eisen model example, I, I, this sum will be around with just two states. I can sum over the one which are positively magnetized and the one which is negative magnetized. Okay? But the difference here is that you have many. Yeah? And now, when now or? So yeah, yeah, I mean, I can do this because n is large, yes. So it's because in this way, the probability really concentrate around, around this minima. Yeah, it's just, this is true only when, when n is large. Yeah. Okay, so now, well, we know that the, when I look to the energy here, you see, I mean, that there is something which is simple, which is for the p-spin spherical model is more complicated for others, but for the p-spin spherical model, for example, I just follow the states, okay? If I have a state in energy zero, I mean, it's the state at temperature T is just, well, the state which is follow, uh, I can follow it, okay? Because I, as I told you, mi alpha is just si alpha times square root of Q. So this means that here I know that, I mean, if I look at a certain temperature, I know that here we'll have, if I look to the states in terms of free energy, here I have a very few states, and then if I go up, I have an exponential number of, uh, of, of states, and so I can define a configurational entropy, S of F, which is equal to log 
of nf divided by n. So where this is the number of states which have free energy between small f and f plus df divided by the number of degrees of freedom, okay? And this is nothing else than the generalization of what we compute yesterday. Yesterday we computed the, this for the energy, and now, well, uh, we have many states, and we do a, one can do, in principle, exactly the same computation, but for f, okay? This can be done. I mean, it's nothing. Okay, so once I define this, so I can rewrite this sum in a useful way. In one way that should remind you something. So I can integrate over, I integrate, I sum over all states that have free energy between, between f and f plus ds. So here we have n of f, exponential minus beta f of big N. So what I'm doing here is that I pack together all states which have the same free energy, and all states which have the same free energy give me the same uh, Boltzmann weight. And here I have a number, I have to count how many of them I have. Okay? And now, while well, this, I know that, so I can rewrite this like the integral over df of exponential of n sf minus beta f. Okay? And so now you see, well, we get something which should remind you exactly what we did for the random energy model. Uh, in the first lecture, except that in the random energy model, what we had was the energy. Here we have the free energy. But otherwise, I can get now the thermodynamic just studying this other point. I mean, this, this integral by this other point. Um, okay, let me... I will go quick, because we did it already for, for the REM. So now I have S of F. Here I have F. S of F is, let's say, like this. Okay, at, at least if I'm, let's say, I start to study at low temperature. So at low temperature, I'm here, there are all these states. It's true that if I go to very high temperature, there are no more states because fluctuations are too strong. But at most small temperature, I have many states. I have an S of F. And this integral here will be dominated by the states that have a free energy at which the slope of this curve is equal to beta. And now I have here, I have F min, which is the free energy of the states, I mean, of the lowest states. This is just, these are the ones which correspond to states with, I mean, if I put this to temperature zero, this, is, this will become the energy of the ground state. And here, what I have is the free energy of the threshold state. Okay? And what I want to compute is Z. Okay, actually what I want to compute is log of z divided by n. So you see that log of z divided by n, if I do this by subtle point, will be equal to s of f star minus beta of f star, where f star is, well, the value that maximizes uh, s of f minus beta f. Saying differently is the value, is these values here, okay, f star. Okay. Okay, so now I would like to study what happens raising the temperature. So let's start by studying the system at low temperature and I want to see well what I mean how the free energy behave and how the thermodynamics behave. Okay. Questions? Uh, so th this thing yeah, yeah, yeah. here. Is it possible that you don't have like a higher energy? Right? So that it becomes uh, you destroy the uh, you destroy this uh, the. Yeah, I think yes. I, I mean, I don't have uh, an example in I mean top of my head, but I don't see. I mean, it doesn't happen in this model, but that you have system in which. Uh, you put a little bit of temperature and you destroy a state, in principle it's possible, but uh, I'm, yeah, I don't see any argument against this, but I don't have any example in mind. Okay, other questions? You are quiet because everything is simple or because you are lost? It's after lunch. It's after lunch, I see, okay, <laughs> I see. Okay, so let's, yeah. Sort of 
Yes. Well, I think if I understood correctly, so it's true that here I just put this, yeah. and in principle there are there are corrections. Yeah, for sure there will be corrections, but. Mm, I, I don't think so. I mean, here I'm computing the the number of uh, top states with intensive free energy between F and F plus DF. So. No, no, I don't, I don't think uh, the, the subleading correction are important. I, I mean, at least to compute this. I mean, then it depends what kind of question you ask. But to compute the log, log of z divided by n, I don't think so. Yes? Yeah. So, yes. So this S of f, well, depends on temperature in two ways. So in the case of spin spherical model, it depends in a trivial way in the sense that I know that this point here, as minimum, depends on temperature because uh, it, go, I mean it's, it goes to the energy of the ground state. So in principle, in the case of uh, the P-spin spherical model in which you can just follow the states, this depends on temperature in a simple way. But then there are more, I mean, in, I, I would say, in, well, not more, I mean, in almost uh, all, all other models, things are more difficult. You cannot follow the states. So this means that, I mean, at a given temperature, you have to compute the minima of the free energy uh, landscape, compute N of F, and then compute S of F. And uh, once you know, you know S of F at a certain temperature, you cannot just know by, let's say, simple translation or modification the S of F at another temperature. So yes, in principle, it changed. But yeah, now let's say that we, we look at it just at a fixed temperature. Yeah, it's OK. Yeah, I mean this, yes, in a certain sense, what you are doing is you are saying, okay, I want to compute the, let's say, the, part, the log of the partition function. And normally the log of the partition function, we write it like the entropy minus beta the energy. And now what you are doing is that while you pack together configuration, uh, all the configuration which, uh, which correspond to the same state are together. And so you have, now what you have is that you have a part which is the, entropy related to the different pockets, and then you have the contribution for each given pocket, which is the free energy of that state. So it's a, that, so it's a kind of, say, always thermodynamics, in, but in which this is not the old entropy, it's just the entropy related to the state, and then inside here you have the energy of uh, the state, and then the intrastate uh, entropy, which is the entropy just because you have entropy within one state. Yes? So Q for the moment is just, so, um, so where is it? So Q, I mean, intuitively, it's related to the fluctu just the, f the amplitude of the fluctuation inside uh, one state. I will comment a more, but for the moment, you can just think that is how much it fluctuates. Q is smaller than one. Q is one, exactly, it becomes one at zero temperature. It's a pressure below the microphone. Yes, exactly, yeah. OK, so now we want to compute the free energy of the system. So the free energy of the system is, well, it's obtained from this, OK? So from its principle, the free total free energy is minus beta F total, which is equal to this. And how this behaves as a function of temperature? So we know that at small temperature, this, so if, so there is, if B, beta is below, um, sorry, if the temperature is less than Tc, which means beta larger than beta C, so it means that if I decrease the temperature enough, beta will be uh, large, and then while well, the system will be stuck 
in the lower state, the state which are lowest in the uh, in free energy. Okay, so you will be here. So it, now, if you look to when you are here, the contribution that you get has not this term because the number of states is not exponentially large. And what you get is that the free energy of the system is just given by the free energy of the states which are on the bottom on the free energy landscape. Okay, so this means that if I want to compute the free energy now of the uh, so in, now in blue, what I will put is the free energy of the system. Okay, so the free energy of the system will be uh, the free energy just of the lower state. And this will be until a certain temperature, which is the temperature Tc. Then at Tc, what happens is that now, I mean, the beta is here, so the free energy of the states that dominate the sum will be no more the lowest one, but will be here, will be F star, which is higher, okay? So if I, now I can draw the, um, so here I will put in this color, I will put F star, okay? This is F star, uh, yes, as a function of temperature, okay? So the, what I mean is that when T is larger than Tc, well, the states that dominate are no longer the one on the bottom of the landscape, but are the one which are higher. And if I raise more the temperature, then just look at the figure here. Beta, so beta, uh, so we'll have something which is flatter, okay? So I will have that F star will increase. And then at a certain temperature here, which we'll call T dynamical. So when T is equal to TD, and I will discuss why this is dynamical temperature, the states that dominate are the threshold state. So this happened here. Uh, no, well, I mean, it's, yeah, because as you see, if you see S of F, so the, uh, so when you raise the temperature, I mean, in the competition between lowering the free energy, you can either lower the free energy or you can try to increase the configurational entropy. It's also like this. The more you raise the temperature, the more it's easy. You have to favor the entropy. So this is why F star goes up. So the red eye is a simple straight eye or is it a complicated function? No, it's, yeah, it's a function. Yeah, it's not a straight line. And so the, what instead does the uh, total free energy the total free energy is doing this, okay? So what happens here? So here you have the phase transition, and here so you have a difference between the free energy of the total si of the system and the free energy of the states that dominate the sum, okay? And what is this? Is the entropy, exactly, is the configuration entropy. Actually, is the, uh, if I take the, uh, yeah, it's T, S, so the configuration entropy of, let's say, of F star at that temperature, okay? So you see that, well, this goes up, up, up. And so what you see here, we've got two different temperatures, T, C, and T, D. And then when you go even higher than T, D, then when T is larger than T, D, well, what, ha what happens is that if you look to the free energy landscape, actually the state that is more important is the one which corresponds to mi equal to zero, okay? That if I think to spin system is what we will call the paramagnet, okay? In models in which the models of interacting particle would be the liquid. So it's the state in which fluctuations are so strong that, I mean, you can go, I mean, you can, I mean, it's really... Uh, well, in a certain sense, I mean, when you, you are going up in this way, then, I mean, above this temperature TD, I mean, fluctuations are so strong that you can really navigate easily in almost the entire configuration space, okay? Uh, still, I mean, you have to see, so there is also, well, another temperature here that I will call T, uh, H. I mean, even though when T is larger than TD, the free energy uh, is given by the free energy of the paramagnetic state. Still, you have some, I mean, some state, uh, but they don't contribute to the total free energy, but they are there. Okay? Yes? Uh, 
uh, should necessarily uh, disappear at the same time in general? Yeah. Yeah, they are marginally stable. Yes, they are marginally stable along all this line. Uh, okay, I don't know. I have to check. I mean, I thought that you 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 might have them a little bit more, but okay, maybe you are right. Is the cross is here? Yeah, maybe I have to check. Yeah. Okay. In general, yeah, I don't know, but okay, let's let's say so for the piece is here. It's not important for, for the rest. Yeah. Okay, so let me see. Okay, so let, let, me, now, let me now draw pictorially the, how the system samples the configuration space. So imagine that now I take the config, I mean, consider the configuration, so the energy landscape, and I do a cut at a given energy. Okay? And I look to the configuration that I get doing this cut. So what is this? This is nothing else than the microcanonical measure. Okay? So you can think this is a way to think about it, or you can think that I look to the uh, Boltzmann probability distribution and I want to know what are the configurations that are important when, that are sampled when I am at temperature T. And I want to give you a picture because it's an interesting picture that you might see uh, in other lectures. So at high temperature, so it's what I get uh, is something that, in principle, so I draw it in this way, okay? It's a very sketchy and phenomenological way. So what I mean by this is that, well, I mean, I have my s configuration space. There are some regions in which I will not go because they are at high in energy, but otherwise it's very well connected, okay, in my cut. Okay, and this happens at very high temperature, okay? Then at a certain point, I will have that I still have this big thing here, which is what I call the paramagnetic state, but I have also small blobs which correspond to top states, okay? So at what temperature this will happen, given what I have on, on the other blackboard? Sorry? Not, not the threshold. Oh, well, sorry, it's, it's a TH, actually. So a TH, so you know that a TD is where, I mean, the uh, partition function is given by many, many different states. Above TD is the paramagnet that wins, but still you have some states there. They are not important, but they are there. So this is a TH. Then what happens then a TD? is that this thing, you should think that it becomes, so I mean, it becomes more and more fragmented and at TD, this is what you get. You have an exponential number of small things. And the transition from this to this is you have to think that this is breaking up, okay? The connection between, I mean, the different portion are becomes smaller and smaller, okay? And then what you know is that I mean, in this regime, I have an exponential number of states that dominate the sum that gives you the partition function. But then the more I go down in temperature, the more this configuration entropy is going down. And when I arrive at TC, there are just a few, which are the one on the bottom of the landscape, that give you a contribution. Okay? So we're just drawing this way. Just a few. And this is TC. TC or TK, like Kaltzmann. Okay? So it's the... This is the temperature at which you have the thermodynamic transition, okay? And actually, this should, I mean, I hope you see there is a connection with what Chris did this morning. So, so the, the interesting thing, and this is the, the, something on which I'm insisting, is that, I mean, this picture that you have of the energy landscape is what we, get, we really work out in the case of the epispin spherical model. Then I put the temperature, and this I have the picture that I have of the free energy landscape, but this is very general. And it happens in many, many different systems. And indeed, it happens in systems that, uh, like, uh, that you can find in computer science, random, like random KSAT. And so instead of thinking to the microcanonical measure, you can actually think to the space of configuration. And if you think to the space of configuration, this is what uh, actually 
today Chris described. This was what is called the condensation, alpha condensation, and this is the dynamical temperature. Okay? This is also called TMCT that was discussed. Okay? Um, let me see if I want to say something else. Okay, so that's all I want to say about the thermodynamics. So, uh, yeah. No, I don't think so. I mean, because you really need, I think, uh, I mean, really, you, you have to be in, the, in that setup. Here you have continuous variable at finite temperature, so I don't think there is a such transition. Yeah. Okay. So, but I think it's, this picture is nice, and well, indeed, I mean, it's, it, I mean, I don't know where, whether. Chris is going, no, Chris not, probably is not going to talk more about this, maybe Florent, but uh, just to tell you that, I mean, this is what we find in the Pispin spherical model, but for example, it was also what was published in a paper by, uh, well, many people here in the audience about, about the space of configuration of random case up, which was really something important. So in the sense, I mean, the Pispin spherical, I mean, the making a bridge from the Pispin spherical model to supercool liquids, it's a long way and uh, it's difficult. But these kind of models within mean field theory can be really be important and directly, it can be directly applied to a uh, central problem in computer science. And in that case, you really get, a, I mean, exact results which are relevant for people working in that area. Okay, so now that I said about the thermodynamics, I want to tell you about things about the dynamics. And again, I mean, there is no computation. There are just some hand waving. So something that is important that is that as you see here when I drew this curve, so here when I cross TD, nothing happened in the thermodynamics. Okay? So really that transition is here at TC, and instead of TD, well, at least if I look to uh, the energy, the specific heat, nothing happens. So there is a term second order thermodynamic transition here, and here there is nothing, but there is actually a dynamical transition that was discussed already a little bit this morning by Gilles. And so it will be discussed more, uh, I think, by David Reichman. So let me just tell you what. Uh, yes, let me do ball. That I always forget. So dynamics. So what you can think about the dynamics now is that, well, what is dynamics at the finite temperature T? Uh, is expl stochastic exploration of the configuration space. Okay. So now, if I am, a, let's say, at this temperature here, in which if I pick a configuration at random, a typical equilibrium configuration at random, well, I will fall here or here, because this is the big part of the configuration space. And then the system will move stochastically, will wander inside here. And you can think that in this case, the dynamics is easy. And so this is, well, if you look to the correlation function, something like, let's say, C of t, which is 1 over n, sum over i, si of t, si of 0. And again, it's not very important what kind of stochastic dynamics you consider. You can take a Langevin dynamics for this, for the P-spin spherical model. You can take Metropolis dynamics. You always get qualitatively the same thing. And so what you will get in this regime here is that the correlation function goes down rather fast. OK? And now, when you approach TD, what happens is that what you have to think is that when you approach TD, actually, just before TD, actually, these states were connected a little bit, OK? There were some connection, OK? And you know also that, I mean, they were, you, you know that once you are, so this, I mean, I just draw in things that are valid here, OK? So it's not, so if you are below TD, there is no con connection, but you are t at TD plus epsilon, there are more connection between the states, okay? And these are the connections that disappear. So if the system tries to move, it will move fast. If I take one configuration at random, at the temperature, I will fall in one of these uh, blobs. I will first explore very fast what happens inside, and then very, very slowly, I will find the, uh, the path to go to another, okay? But then this disappears below TD. 
So what happens is that approaching TD, the correlation function, C of T, as a function of log of T, does exactly what was discussed today by Gilles. So it will go down to a certain value. It will stay here for a long time. This is when you explore, you just stay inside the blob. And then the system will find a way to escape. And the more you are approach TD, the longer is this, and the larger is the relaxation time. So this means that uh, so when T goes to TD from above, this relaxation time here diverge. And actually, we know, and this, I mean, all this will be done, I think, uh, in detail by David Reichman. So the time scale diverge like 1 over t minus td to some power gamma that you can compute and that depends on the model. OK? And now, what is this value here? This value here is exactly what I call q, OK? Are the fluctuation inside the state, OK? So, I mean, all the things come uh, in a good way together. This, I tell you that this should be the relaxation within the state. And indeed, I mean, if you, you solve the dynamics and you can solve it, and you look to this, what is this value of this plateau, the value of Q that you will get is exactly the one that you can get uh, from the thermodynamics. So, looking at the free energy. Okay? And then you have that this, this, uh, this time scale that diverge. So, just a moment, I will take the question. So just to tell you again, so the physics behind this transition, which is just a dynamical transition, nothing happened to the free energy, uh, to the total free energy, is really that is a, there is a rarefaction of, let's say, channels for relaxation. So you can stay in one blob, but then, I mean, if you want really to explore the configuration space, you don't find any more channels. And once you are below TD, well, then if you are inside of one of these, then it takes an exponential time in N to go to one of those, okay? Because you have to go very, very high in the energy landscape. So you have to jump over a barrier, which are of order big N. Yes, just a moment. Take the question. Yeah? Yeah. Sorry, this is? Yeah. Yeah. So within mean field theory, th there is a critical point. So at TD, you have a really a dynamical transition. So you have critical exponent, you have a diverging length. I mean, as much as you can have a diverging length within mean field theory, but you have it. You have a dynamical susceptibility that diverge, and maybe Gilles will say something later this afternoon. So it's really a critical point, but it's a dynamical critical point. Nothing happens in the thermodynamics, but otherwise, you have a critical theory that you can work out. So, uh, I mean that, well, first, nothing happened in the thermodynamics, at least if you look at the total free energy. If you look to the free energy landscape, of course, something happened because you see it. But in the total free energy, nothing happens. And I say dynamical critical point, I mean that the relaxation time diverge. That's the first thing. So, if I look to a correlation function, I can define a relaxation time, and the relaxation time diverge. So, it, there is a dynamical transition. And then I can study, I can also introduce critical exponent. I can introduce dynamical susceptibility. I can really study this like in critical phenomena. But it's dynamical, so I have to just to focus on dynamical variables. And this will be done, I think, by David Reichman in all details. Yes? So if we have six time steps instead of local update, I know the cost of the rate of update. Yeah. Well, it depends if you do a clustering update, which is extremely smart, uh, you can destroy this. But the problem is that you have to find the, I mean, uh, I mean, in general, when you do a cluster update, it works if you know something about, I mean, the uh, cooperative move that you have to do. In this case, if I want to go to this state, to, from, to this state, okay, maybe if you, well, if you do a cluster move that just change the spins to the value that I have here to the value that I have here, so you destroy the, the slow dynamics. But the problem is that, in principle, you don't know the value of the uh, spins here. So, well, so it's difficult to find the cluster dynamics that, that just destroy this. Ye yes? So what was the 
Yes, I think it's, I mean, if you, if you do it, I think from the top uh, expression, I mean, doing top, it's really not uh, clear. I mean, why? I mean, I don't see a way to prove it. But actually, if you, if you see that all this actually is encoded in the replica uh, uh, solution, then within replica, it has to be like this. So it means that somehow, I mean, the replica, again, the replica, and this is something that I will uh, discuss more, but I mean, it's when I say that I compute this for the pit spin spherical model, but then you should believe that this is universal. So nobody asked why. But the reason is that, of course, I can compute it directly for the pit spin spherical model, but actually the replica method and the replica symmetry breaking is actually a way to encode the property of the landscape. And so from this point of view, it looks like that replica solution give rise to this property of the landscape. Now, I don't have an intuitive explanation. I don't know if somebody has it. Yeah. Ah. Uh, in yeah, so, so in some time, so exactly, okay, this is a good question, and, uh, well, uh, maybe actually I will answer in, in five minutes, it's just the follow. Other questions? Okay, so if there are no other questions, well, first, I would like to tell you that, as I, as I again, as a disclaimer, all this is well defined within mean field theory. If you want to go to finite dimension, then there are many, I mean, tricky questions that one has to address. And again, this, this is something that one has to do, and I will try to do a little bit tomorrow. Uh, but this is what you get within mean field theory. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, definitely. So something that you can do, and I think that I could have said, is that you can look, for example, to what happens if you start from out of equilibrium. So let's say, no, well, you take a, a configuration at random, so it means that you are at infinite temperature, and then you quench the temperature uh, to a very small value. So in that case, what happens is that, okay, so it depends. So in the in p spin spherical model, where everything is rather uh, easy, what happens is that the system goes down, let's say in the energy landscape, but then they have the fluctuation by the temperature, and what it happens is that at very long time, it will, will, be, it will approach actually the states which are here. It will never relax to these states, meaning that the system will, I mean, it will never arrive exactly here, it will almost equilibrate, but then it will find some direction to, to escape. And this is what is called aging, and this is what uh, Leticia Cugliandolo will discuss. And again, in this model, you can really study aging, meaning you can define the correlation function, which depends on two time, write dynamical equation, and get, again, exponent. You can have a real quantitative description, which, I mean, and then you, that you can understand based on this landscape. Okay, so let me go now to the second part of my lecture. Uh, which is about, okay, maybe I have the second board, okay. So which is about, actually, what is the order parameter of, this trans of the transition? What is the ordering field? And something that we call the Franz Parisi potential. Okay, so again, just to motivate what we do, I will start with the IZ model or the ferromagnetic transition that you all know well, and then I will try to generalize starting from this. So in the case of the ferromagnetic transition, you know what is the order parameter, parameter which is the magnetization. And you know what is the ordering field? Well, it's the external magnetic field. Okay, so, and, well, you can define a free energy, which is the Landau free energy that was um, discussed this morning by Gilles, which 
within Minfield theory, and we are within Minfield theory, so we don't worry about, I mean, the things that Gilles told you this morning, uh, has this type of behavior. This is minus M0, this is M0, and we are at T less than TC, okay? So we have the phase transition, we are at T less than TC, and here I drew it in a, ah, they should be at the same eight, but they are not. Huh? I said you have an order. Yes, I have an order, <laughs> exactly. So, okay, they, they are at the same eight, okay? Um, okay, well, so this is what you get, and what you know is that, I mean, why this is called the ordering field H? It's because, actually, if H, um, so let me, so H allow you to break the symmetry. So if you put H equal to zero plus, what it happens is that you tilt this a little bit. And since what you have to do is always to minimize the free energy, so the state that will minimize the free energy will be the one with the positive magnetization. And now if I change H a little bit to H equal to zero minus, so the one that will... Um, uh, minimize the free energy is the one with minus M0, okay? So it really, and that H is actually equal to zero, I have a degeneracies between the two. So this is why this is the ordering thing. It's the one that will tell you if I put a little bit of zero plus, or if I put a little bit of zero minus, there is something that jumps. The something that jumps is the order parameter, the magnetization, and the way to see this jump, to see that the system is ordered, is the magnetic field, okay? And now let's see also what happens in general if I put a big H. So if I take a H which is, let's say, very uh, negative, so I will favor a lot this state. So this will go down, this one will go up, and you know that at a certain point you will reach a spinodal, okay? So this is when you are at H spinodal, which is a negative value of H, at which actually this minimum that is here disappears. Okay, so the positive magnetite state is not defined anymore, even as a metastable state, and you have just this one. Then if I increase H, well, then I will go to a case like this. Then I will arrive at H equal to zero to the symmetric case. Well, again, symmetric. And then, well, then I will start with H positive. I will start to favor, actually, the positive state unt until I reach the spinodal here, H spinodal, at which actually the one which is negatively magnetized disappear. okay? Okay, this is a reminder, and now what I would like to do is, okay, can I do something similar for the glass transition that I described, for the thermodynamic transition that happened at, at TC? So what is the order parameter? What is the ordering field? And what is the Landau free energy? So this is the other question that I would like to address. Questions? Okay. Okay, so let's see. So what is the order parameter and what is the ordering field? Um, okay, so how I can, so what I know is that imagine that I am a low temperature, exactly like in the ferromagnetic system, and I want to make, I mean, want to make the difference, I want to have a field that favor one of the possible amorphous states. I have many of them, which are in competition, and it's not an exponential number, but I have many, and I want to find a field that favors one of them. So how I can do? The problem is that in the case of the ferromagnetic IZ model, I know what I have to do, because I know that the state is all spins up, so I put a magnetic field which points, uh, which is positive on each side. Now if you think to uh, a liquid, uh, which forms a glass, for example, well, uh, what you have is that the particles are arranged in a very disordered way. And maybe, I mean, this looks disordered to your eyes, but instead it's really ordered, meaning that, I mean, the system to find a very low energy configuration has to put, in a certain sense, a particle here and then carefully choose, an, uh, carefully choose the position of the neighboring one and the neighbor of the neighbor and so on and so forth. He has to do it. He realizes a configuration which is very low energy. It's very non random in the sense that if I start to scramble a little bit, the energy will go up. And so I know that if I put the particle here in a certain way, I will have to put the particle in exact position somewhere else. 
But at the same time, if I give the configuration to you, well, you will say, okay, this looks disordered. So you don't know a priori what field you have to put in order to favor this configuration with respect to another one. So what the idea is, what, what the idea is, is to, okay, we don't know, but uh, what we can do is that we can take an equilibrium configuration, C equilibrium. So this configuration is taken by, so let's say that I uh, take a configuration at random uh, from the equilibrium measure at temperature T. Okay? Don't tell me why. I don't know. You do a simulation. I mean, this is just a, some, let's say something, a thought experiment. You get this equilibrium configuration. Okay? Now, if the system is at low temperature, so if you are below TC, if I take a configuration at random, I will fall in one of these few states. Let's say this one. Okay? And now, well, the other parameter now that I will introduce is the overlap between, so I will take now another configuration C, and I will look to the overlap between the configuration C and the configuration C equilibrium. Let's say the overlap at a certain position X. And so now let's discuss what is this overlap. So the overlap, I mean, the definition of the overlap depends on the system at hand. So for a spin system, I mean, the global overlap, for example, will be just the sum over i from 1 to n of, let's say, si, si reference divided 1 over n. So this will be the total overlap, OK? So what you are doing, you are comparing uh, the configuration. So if si is very similar to the si reference, so it means that the si reference it's looks disorder. So some spins point up, some spins point down. They are carefully chosen, the position. And now, if I, what I, I mean, this, what I define as overlap is something in which the overlap will be high if the configuration C will be very similar to the configuration SI reference. Okay? And again, the overlap depends on the, uh, your system at hand. So if you have particles, for example, then what you want to know is that, okay, I take uh, some arrangement of the particle then uh, for the reference configuration. And then I would say that the overlap is high if I take another configuration in which the particles are more or less close to the one of the original configuration. And actually, a precise definition, I think, will be given by Ludovic Berthier next week or at the end of this week. Okay? So for the moment, I mean, just think that the overlap is something that is high, let's say, close to 1, uh, if C is similar to C equilibrium uh, at x and is low, let's say 0, if C is different from C equilibrium at x, OK? It just measure how much the configuration looks the same. OK, and now why this is my order parameter is because actually I'd, I take the original Hamiltonian and I add the field. OK, so now, of course, I, I always mess up with notation. So H is the Hamiltonian, which has nothing to do with the magnetic field, which is, which is there, OK? So let's A, H of S or h of c, or h of c. So the Hamiltonian, h of c, what I do is that I add a term to the Hamiltonian, which is like an extra field. So that will be plus sum over x. I put an epsilon, well, let's put an epsilon x here. And then here I have the overlap between the configuration c, the, config the reference configuration, and this is a position x, OK? So what I'm doing is that I'm adding to the Hamiltonian a term in which if I take epsilon x positive, I'm favoring configuration which looks similar to the configuration C equilibrium. OK? Uh, with a minus. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So it's like, uh, so otherwise, I mean, otherwise, exactly. If epsilon is positive, I want to get something that decreases the value of the Hamiltonian. OK? Yes. Uh, but is X just a parameter? No, X is, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, X is a position in space. So, it's, uh, so you have to think that this is just the equivalent for the ferromagnetic case. What you do is that you have an energy in which you have, let's say, sum over I and J, G I J, S I S J. And then to this, you add a term which is minus sum over I. I mean, I is the, c the index on, on, of the side of the lattice. H i s of i, okay. So this is the field which couple 
to SI. And here is the same. I just use X well, because again I'm bad with notation. But X is a uh, is like the same thing of I. Okay, is the position uh, in space. There was another question. Okay. No, I mean this. I mean I, again, don't I mean don't focus too much on the on I mean on this example. I mean what? Okay, yeah. I mean Q. What? So first, the thing that I want to say is that what I'm going to look then is epsilon of x, which does not depend on x. Okay, in the following, it's just that in principle, exactly like the magnetic field can depend on x, also epsilon can depend on x. But okay, I will just look to the case in which epsilon of x. So imagine, well, maybe. Okay, I will tell you in a minute something in a case in which epsilon of x depends on x. Okay? Other question? Okay, so now why this? Uh, so now what I want to say is that this overlap Q is the order parameter, and um, so let me. Yes. Sorry? Yes. So I always look into the overlap between the configuration C and the configuration that I take at random from the equilibrium measure. This one? H of C. Ah, this is H of C. That's it. So, I mean, I, I have the Hamiltonian as a function of the configuration. I understood correctly. This was the question. This is C. So, what I'm doing is that, okay, say it again. I, no, I mean, this is C, this is C, this is C, this is C equilibrium. Yeah, I mean, it's, okay, let me say it again. Let me say what I wrote. So, I pick one configuration at random. Well, maybe Camille will explain. Okay, so I can go on. Um, okay, so Okay, so my, now what I mean, what I want to tell is that the order parameter for the transition is the overlap. And the ordering field is the epsilon, the coupling, so which is the coupling between C C and C equilibrium. Okay, and why is this is why is so? So let's think. So let's say that we are we are at T less than T C and as I show you here, well what I have well okay this is okay, what I have is that if I take one configuration at random from the equilibrium measure, I will fall in one of these few pockets. Okay? Now these pockets correspond to free energy states that have exactly the same free energy. Okay? at the intensive uh, level, okay? Now, if I put, so if I now take another configuration C, in principle, if I don't put any epsilon, well, this other configuration can fall in one of the other states, or in the same, okay? Now, if I put a little bit of epsilon, so just epsilon equal to zero plus, so then, if the initial configuration was here, since C equilibrium was here, then I had other possible states, but now the free energy, if I take a, a, a certain epsilon, now the, uh, let's say, the f I change the free energy in such a way that for the new system in presence of the coupling, the free energy to fall inside these states will be, lar will be smaller than the other of a term which is of order of epsilon, the typical Q that I have inside this, okay, the typical overlap that I have between a configuration, C equilibrium and the configuration that I take inside this pocket, times L to, times N, okay? So it will decrease the free energy of, I mean, this situation, so 
falling in, inside the same state in which it was the configuration of the equilibrium by this term. And you see that if epsilon is very small, but still, I mean, it's, it's finite, then I get an extensive contribution. So what the system will do is it will fall inside this, OK? So in a certain sense, I did exactly similarly to the ferromagnetic case, in which in the ferromagnetic case, I had the degeneracies. I had two systems. And then thanks to the ordering field, I just whoop, put one down, and then the system fall always here. Here I have, well, more than one state, but still I don't have an exponential number. And then in this way, I just pick one and I put it down, OK? Is it OK? And then yeah. Exactly. So you, what you have to do is you always have to take the thermodynamic limit first, and then epsilon going to zero later. In this way, you always have this term which, which wins. OK? And now, so if you are with me, then what we have to do is that we have the other parameter, we have the ordering field, and then we want to get the equivalent of the Landau free energy. OK? Which I will do on this side. So what is the equivalent of the Landau free energy? Which in this context is called the Franz Parisi potential. So let me remind you again what, what is the Landau free energy in the context of the ferromagneticizing model. So how I get f of m? So what I have to do is I have to take the sum over all configuration with the Boltzmann weight, exponential minus beta hc. And then I want to impose that the magnetization of the configuration c, sorry, there is a z here, is equal to m. So I'm just summing over all configuration in which the other parameter is what I want. And then what I have to do is if I want to find the Landau free energy, I have to take the log of this and multiply by one minus 1 over beta times big N, OK? OK, this is, well, what you, what you get and what, I mean, and what you expect that it behaves like this when t is less than tc. So now, well, let's do exactly the same thing. So now we know what is the order parameter. We know what is the ordering field. So, well, what you can define as the Franz Parisi potential will be something that we denote by V, V of Q, will be minus 1 over beta n, the log of, I sum over all configuration C. I always have exponential minus beta h of C divided by Z. And then I impose that the overlap between C and C equilibrium, so that I have to pick up at the beginning, is equal to Q. OK? So that's the definition. I mean, it's really the equivalent. I mean, if I'm right, if the order parameter is what I'm saying, well, I want, I want to study as the equivalent of the Landau free energy is this. It's how much it costs to have a certain value of the other parameter q. Question? Yeah. Is the overlap in the whole space? Yes. Yes. This one is, let's say, sum over x of q c c equilibrium x divided by n. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, and I think I will, well, so in principle, exactly like the free energy in a disorder system, I expect that this will be self-averaging. But then, if I have to compute it, indeed, if I want to compute it, then I will have, in principle, I will, what I will compute is the average of this, 
over the configuration C equilibrium. So what this means, okay? So in principle, this is like a free energy. Well, so free energy in general is self-averaging, but I mean, in principle, you're right, I have to average over C equilibrium, so I have to do this. And I will tell you roughly, I think in five minutes and 10 minutes, how we compute this, okay? But for the moment, this is just the definition, but you're right, yes. It's per particle, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's like here, okay, I put a big F, I should put maybe a small F, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now you, we can compute this. For example, for the P-spin spherical model, we can do it. We are not going to do it, but it can be done. I will just tell you what is the beginning of the computation, and then you will do the computation next week with Florent Zakala. Okay. But now what we are going to do today is that we are going just to guess the result without doing the computation. Okay, so let's, which is nice, we don't have to do the computation, we just obtain the result, being, uh, trying to, uh, I mean, trying to use the physics that we know until now. Okay, so, so first thing, uh, look at also what is this. I mean, this thing here is, you can also think that it's just the probability uh, to get an overlap Q with the equilibrium configuration C equilibrium, okay? Uh, if I pick one configuration C at random with the Boltzmann measure. And so, I mean, this relation means that P of Q will, go, will be like exponential of minus beta N of V of Q, okay? It's exactly like, uh, so, so V of Q is, in a certain sense, is what is called a large deviation function related to the order parameter Q, okay? So, I mean, I, this is just a way to rewrite what I, I wrote here. So, but this is a way that allow, you, allow us actually now to guess what is the form of V of Q. So, let's draw V of Q. Okay, so let's... So, first thing... As we know, because we discussed it several times already, when we have a function which is, I mean, a probability law which behaves like this, there is a big N here. So, well, we know that the Q which correspond to the actually minimum of this, the Q min will also be equal to the average of Q, okay? Because this function is very much concentrated around the minimum of V of Q. And so now let's draw what we expect for V of Q, when T is less than TD, and is larger than TC, okay? So we are in the regime in which, well, in the regime which is here, okay? This one in which the Boltzmann measure is given by an exponential number of, of different states. Yes? Well, it's always, uh, it's a pr well, uh, so you have to always to think that V of Q, so yeah, I mean, it's approximative in the sense that there, there can be subleading contribution with respect to big N. Yeah, okay. Now, the, this, this is the definition. This is the definition of V of Q, but once you compute this, if you want to rewrite the P of Q, I mean, what you have to say is that this is not really true because this is, here you have, a, I mean, here you have a limit n going to infinity, okay? So this means that, in principle, I can have a correction here, but this correction absurd leading with respect to big N, okay? Okay, so now, how is V of Q? So where is the minimum of V of Q when T is between TC and TD? So what I'm doing, so I take a configuration at random, C equilibrium, and then I take another one, what will be the overlap, the typical overlap between the two? Sorry? Zero, yeah. So, I mean, it's, I have an exponential number of possible states in which I can fall. I take one configuration C equilibrium, I fall in one. Then I take another, another uh, uh, configuration C. While this one, I have an exponential number of possibility, I will fall in another one. And since it's another one, it's another state, so the overlap will be small, will be zero, okay? So what I'm going to expect is that the minimum will be in Q equal to zero. Okay, so we'll draw it like this. Then, okay, so what I know is also I know that if I take the equilibrium configuration C, C equilibrium, which is in one state, so let me, 
Let me draw here again all the states. So I take the equilibrium, I fall inside here. I know that there is a possibility, which is, happens rarely, but there is a possibility that I fall inside this configuration C, fall inside the same state. Okay? And when this happens, actually, I have a high overlap with the uh, equilibrium configuration. Okay? And I will denote this overlap QEA as I did actually uh, when I discussed the dynamics. You remember? In the dynamics, I mean, the, the uh, when I discussed the dynamics before, if I take a configuration which falls inside the same state, this has an overlap which we call QEA. Okay, so I will have a case in which I have QEA here, and uh, so the value of V of Q, well, will be here, and this is they co correspond to the case in which I have C equilibrium which is inside here, and I have C which is here. Okay, and now, well, the other thing that I can I mean, I can guess, is that now if I try to ask that the overlap with the equilibrium configuration is not zero, so it's not everywhere, is not QEA, so, so it's not here, is somehow in the middle. So what you can think is that this is going to be less good than being here, okay? Because I know that I have these states are separated, so while I'm asking, no, I don't want to be here, I don't want to be everywhere else, I want to be a little bit farther, okay? So what you get in this case, you can try to guess, is that actually in this case it will go up, okay? And then you will have something like this. Okay? And this, of course, you can compute it uh, and you will do it, but this is what you can get, I mean, you can guess. And now what is this height here? Remember, is, so, here is the probability to fall inside. So what I'm losing from here to here. So here I, I have the configuration C equilibrium in one state. I take another one, it can fall in any other of the states, okay? Here, what I ask actually is that it's fall inside the same state. It's, it's more likely, uh, sorry, it's less likely. But how much is less likely? Yes, I mean, the difference between these two, which is the log of the probability, is the, ent the configurational entropy. So for, uh, since I define this like V of Q, this will be the temperature times the configurational entropy at temperature T. Okay? Okay. So this is what I get um, between TK and TD. And now, well, let me tell you what happens if I go down in temperature, if I go up. So if I go down in temperature, well, what happens, you know, I mean, the, the configuration entropy goes down, and so this will do like this, and then at a certain point, it will be like this, okay? And this, at this point, this is T equal to Tc, or equal to Tk, so this means that now, while at this temperature, I have, so this is going down in temperature, uh, at this temperature, Tc or Tk, when I take, when I pick a co an equilibrium configuration, then I, when I take another one, I have some probability actually to fall inside the same state, okay? Because there are not exponentially many, so now now it's it's it can it can happen. And then, well, instead, if I raise the temperature, what you get here is that this thing will arrive at a certain point. This minimum disappear. And what do you think is this case? What does it correspond to? TD, exactly. This is TD. Is the case in which, well, now at TD, I know that the states actually that dominate the sum disappear, okay? And so, well, this minimum disappear also, okay? Of course, all these things that I'm telling you by words are, I mean, you can compute it by uh, analytic computation and you can check that it's true, but, I mean, this is the picture that you get, okay? So, there are so, okay, let me summarize. So, if, you, if I do a translation with the, uh, um, with the ferromagnetic system, so in the ferromagnetic system I have the magnetization, which is the uh, order parameter. Here what I get is the overlap, Q. The ordering field in that the magnetic case is H, so the, fer the external magnetic field. Here will be epsilon, the coupling between the replica. And then the, uh, what is called TC, in this case, is what I call TK, so I mean the thermodynamic transition is where the two minima have the same eighth, 
Okay, that's the same thing. And what is called the spinodal here is what we call t-dynamical here. Okay, so this here the spinodal of the high uh, overlap phase is that correspond to the dynamical transition. Okay. Now, in the five minutes that remain, uh, I would like just to tell you in a few words how you can compute this thing. What's the idea with the replica? And then end with some remarks. So if you want to compute this big thing, so what you get is that you have to compute the log of what is inside the square parenthesis on the other blackboard, and you have to take the average. Okay, so well, what do you do is you will use the replica method, and you will say that, so and the average is the average with respect to C equilibrium. So what you will do is that you will say, okay, this is will be equal to 1 over small n, the log of, let's say, this thing to the power n, average inside the logarithm with respect to C equilibrium. Okay? I mean, this is just the replica trick that, that we discussed already. So now let's write what is this. So this is 1 over n, small n, log. And now what is the average with respect to, with respect to C equilibrium? Will be just the sum over C equilibrium of exponential minus beta h C equilibrium divided by z. Okay. This is correspond to the average with respect to C equilibrium. And now what is this things to the n, to the power n? Well, I have to take n replica, this n replica with the Boltzmann weight, and I want that each one of the replica has an overlap Q with the equilibrium configuration. So it will be, I have uh, the sum here, I have to add exponential minus beta h C1 divided by z blah, 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 exponential minus beta h cn divided by z. And then I have to impose that I have to do a product between from a from 1 to small n and ask that all the overlap, bit, okay, we write it. Okay, let me write it here. The product from a 1 to small n of delta q C A C equilibrium minus is equal to Q, okay? And then I have F. okay, so okay, let me say in words what is this. So in order to compute this, what I have to do is that I have to take n plus one replica. You have n plus one because there is the reference configuration, and then there are the small n replica that I have to use. So I have n plus one replica. And then I have to impose that actually all these n replicas has an o all they all have an overlap Q C A uh, an overlap Q with the equilibrium configuration, okay, which instead is free. Okay. And now while well, this is a complicated problem, but in principle, well it's n plus one replica and uh, sorry, and then I also have to put no, it's fine. So you have a problem with n plus one replica that you can study. And then if you starting from this, in principle you can compute the V of Q, which is here, okay? Okay, so now just two remarks and then I stop. So maybe the first remark is technical. Uh, let me see if I'm doing it. So you can, now when you use the replica method as you saw in the homework, uh, what happens is that now you have a small n replica and you have to take the small n which going to zero and then you have to, this, I mean, you could have what is called the replica symmetry breaking. So you might, you might have take a replica symmetry breaking solution. Okay, if you understood now, while you sh given the homework that you did, the first homework and the homework that I'm giving to you today, in principle, you should be able to understand why when you do the computation of this potential, you should expect, I mean, a region here. So here a region in which the small n replica will be symmetric and the region here in which you, has, you have RSB, okay? But okay, you cannot probably understand it now, but if you took what you know from homework number one, and if you do the homework number two, without doing any computation, you should think, you should understand why here you should have a 
the intermediate regime in which you have RSB, and here you have RS again, okay? Just thinking about without doing any competition. Okay, so this is one thing. The other thing that uh, I wanted to say is that, so I, what I, uh, I showed to you is that we did an explicit computation of the landscape for the P-spin spherical model. Then I told you this is very general. And uh, why? I mean, there is this universality. And the fact that there is this universality is really related to the replica method. In the sense that, I mean, for a given model, I can do all the computation and find the, uh, the uh, statistical properties of the free energy landscape. But now, what you saw here with, this or with the order parameter uh, Q and with this, let's say, Franz Parisi potential, which is just like the Landau free energy, we have a description of the phase transition, which is very general. Exactly like, I don't know, in the, for the ferromagnetic model, you have a description of the phase transition in terms of M, and then you can translate this description, for example, to the liquid gas transition. And now this, I mean, in terms of this description, actually, you can see that there is a relationship between models which are very different without doing the computation. So you can think, okay, given a model, if I define the overlap, Q, then, well, the uh, a Franz Parisi potential can behave in this way, and then there is a configurational entropy, and then this will go to zero. So this is really, let's say, the, the origin of the universality, which is behind. It's because, well, if you, do, if you do the replica method, if you compute V of Q, well, you have a general description in which all the property of the landscape are encoded into. They are encoded in, a, let's say, not direct, I mean, not completely explicit way, but they are encoded inside. Okay, and this is this kind of potential is something that, so in general, in many models like, I don't know, for example, random KSAT or model like interactive particle system in very high dimension, you don't do the computation as we did for the P-spin spherical model because it's too, it's too difficult. What you do is that you compute the Franz Parisi potential. And from this, well, you, you get that, I mean, it has the property that corresponds to the, that we found for the P-spin spherical model. You can compute the configurational entropy. You can extract it from it without really doing uh, all the computation of the critical points, okay? So this is really what is behind the universality. And uh, actually, there are other ways to use replica to get the property of the landscape. And the homework that I'm uh, giving you today, in which you will see it's easy. There are not big, no big computation. It's just some, uh, you have just to think a little bit about the, uh, the problem. It's another way to uh, compute the property of the free energy landscape, and there's actually a way to understand what really means replica symmetry breaking, at least one step replica symmetry breaking. Why you have it, why you have this solution, and why this solution, one step replica symmetry breaking, is related to the property of the free energy landscape that we discuss. Okay, so that's all for today, and tomorrow I would like to say a few things actually on, so okay, this is what you get in mean field theory. Now, if you go to final dimension, I mean, things are shaky, you are in shaky ground, so many things that are well defined here are not well defined in finite dimension. You have to understand how this theory has to be generalized. So this will be the argument of tomorrow. Yeah, question? Yeah, you might have said this, but it's like I missed it. Uh, so this, this, can I think of this as a first order transition? Shape of this? Uh, yes, it's like, uh, it's like, like yeah, so this is like the spinodal. This is, looks like, from the point of view of V of Q, it's like a first order transition. So the Q, indeed, the value of the order parameter makes a jump. And this... You computed this, and now you treat it in theory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah exactly, because P of Q is the uh, exponential minus beta. And this is related also to something that was asked, I think, uh, maybe two lectures ago. I mean, from the point of view of the thermodynamics, if I, cu I compute the specific heat or uh, the energy, I see that the transition is second order. However, if I look to the overlap, the overlap make a jumps. So the overlap is zero when t is larger than tk, and then it's non-zero, but it uh, has a finite value at tk, okay? Because, I mean, I will fall inside one state and instead of being in, a, in, a, in the other ones. So it has some property of first order phase transition, it has some property of the second order phase transition. And this, you, see, you can see it also in principle. Well, okay, no, this I won't tell you because. Okay, other questions? This one? Yeah. No, this is so approximately. Is so, I mean, exactly. oh, see, yeah, all this is exactly PQ, but PQ is equal to this just to the leading order in small n. 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, the reason is that, so imagine that, I mean, the fact is that here I'm taking 1 over n and the limit n going to infinity. So this means that, imagine that I have 1 over n, then I have my function, which is n v of q, and then I have a correction, which is square root of n, okay? So since, and then I take n, which go to infinity, and I, let's say that I have a c here. So when n go to infinity, this will be equal to v of q, okay? This I can forget, because it's a correction of order 1 of the square root of n. But when I look to p of q, well, p of q, in principle, has the, the term here, okay? Square root of n c. But it's subleading with respect to this one. So this is why I put this approximately equal. So it means that it's equal in the sense that I'm just looking to the leading term in n. Other questions? Yes. So in that uh, expression, how did we drop the sum over CS? Oh, no, no, it's just that it's not there. So it's, I have to sum over all the replicas. C1, C n, small n. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yes, it's because the, um, so Q is defined like sum over I, so that's its real definition, is sum over I from 1 to N, 1 over big N. You can write in this way, S I square. Okay, why it's like this? Because if I take, I take one configuration at equilibrium, I take another one at equilibrium, so both will have a magnetization average of S I, and their overlap will be this. So now you see that, well, if I say that S I is equal to S i alpha times square root of Q. Then if I plug it in here, what I will get is 1 over n, sum over i, S i alpha square times Q. But these are, uh, th this is 1 because, I mean, it's on the sphere. And so I'm sorry, it's not 1. This is n because it's on the sphere, so I get Q. Okay. Other questions? Okay.